This Week in Parasitism is brought to you by the American Society for Microbiology at microbeworld.org slash twip. This Week in Parasitism, episode number eight. Hey, everybody. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and I'm with Dixon Despommiers. Hey, Vince. How are you, Dick? I'm feeling well, thank you. Looks like spring has really sprung, hasn't it? Spring is here. There's no question now. The daffodils are out. The uh, trees are budding. The red bud is budded. The mosquitoes are breeding. Not yet. Oh, well, yes, of course they're breeding. No, they're waking up from their dormancy. There are some that actually wintered over. The tapeworms are taping. The tapeworms are taping. <laughs> I was just in Scotland. Yes? And you were in Taliesin. I was in Taliesin West. Was it good? Yeah, I was immersed in Frank Lloyd Wrightisms. Mm. It was amazing. It was just an amazing place. Would you like to live in a Frank Lloyd Wright creation? No. Why is that? There were too few outlets. The chairs are uncomfortable. No high-speed internet. And the kitchen... He, he didn't think much of kitchens, unfortunately. Well, that's but not very practical, is it? It isn't, and a lot of people objected to it, and they began to change things. And he's uh, famous for having gone into one of the houses while the couple were away because they wanted to change all the furniture. And he brought a hammer and nails with him, and he nailed everything down so they couldn't change it. <laughs> that's how devoted wow. he was to the style that he was producing. He was a, um, a fastidious liver of style. In other words, he invented the modern equivalent to the Bauhaus movement that began in Germany back in the 30s and uh, sort of disappeared because of the Second World War. And you went to learn about vertical farming. I went to teach about vertical farming, actually. <laughs> I was invited by a student. They have 32 students uh, at any one time, and there are two Taliesins. There's a Taliesin in Wisconsin, which is the original... Uh, art studio for the Frank Lloyd Wright School of Architecture. And then there's a summer residence. Um, no, I'll, I'll reverse that. The summer residence is in Wisconsin, and the winter residence is in Scottsdale, Arizona. So for four months of the year, the 32 students migrate down to Scottsdale. And interestingly enough, uh, I know this has nothing to do with the show, but it's interesting to just think about how you train people to learn. Um, as part of their learning exercise, they have to build what is known as a habitat. Mm -hmm. And for everybody out there that's familiar with the term, it's an ecological setting, of course, that an animal occupies that is fully describes, it fully describes their biology. It's not just a place, it's, it, it matches with all of their uh, biological and physical needs. And these students are immersed in architecture so thoroughly that one of their projects is to build their own living space that no one else can live in during the time that they're a student there. And they build it in the surrounding green desert, the Sonoran Desert is right outside this complex of buildings. They're so meticulously designed that as the slope of the mountain approaches Scottsdale, Frank Lloyd Wright selected the site that was at the 15 degree angle of the slope, and every building in this complex, and there must be 20 buildings altogether, have a 15 degree angle theme. It either follows the slope or it actually works against the slope, but it can only be at a 15 degree angle. It makes it congruent with nature. Everything is congruent with itself. Not, I, I would not go so far as to say that it's congruent with nature because nature is kept at bay. There's a clear separation between where nature mm -hmm. is and where the buildings are. And that was one of the, uh, that's as opposed to the habitats that the students built. <clears throat> the students actually build these into the, into the earth. One of the students, in fact, the student that invited me, in, uh, his name is Daniel Dillo, D-I-L-L-O-W, a, a charming individual who uh, was given the task of picking a speaker for this student-generated series, and I was lucky enough to be the one he selected, um, showed me his habitat, which was a, a very, very interesting thing. Each student has to hand-build this from scratch. And in some way, it has to reflect this 15-degree angle uh, motif. So it was fascinating to see all these uh, individualized living spaces stuck out in the middle of the Sonoran Desert within walking distance, of course, of their place of, uh, of study. 
and to see how uniquely uh, designed each one was. And But they all reflected the ethic of the Frank Lloyd Wright School of Architecture, which is angular, squares, and, you know, from a distance you can't tell that it's part of the scene. Uh, that is, you can't see where it is. And when you get up close, you can finally see it. But it's clearly designed differently than the surrounding nature. There are no natural themes to these buildings, which is um, one of the things that I want to talk about in some other kind of uh, context. That is, uh, one of my big interests is how to, how can we get us as a species to better reflect our natural uh, origins in our own lifestyles <clears throat> so that we begin to reflect ecological process and therefore our lives become more balanced and less polluted with all the waste that we can create. And um, I think if we ever learn how to do that, we'll probably live for as long as all the other life forms do on this planet without suffering the ill fate of extinction. So that's that's a that's a big theme, right? And here we are, two infectious disease guys talking about how to head these things off at the pass. And if you look at nature, the controlling elements for populations at least are their parasites. Every population of animal and plant has their own cadre of parasites that come in and limit how many of those there can be. And um, so all these stories that we've been telling and all these life cycles and all these virus stories are all reflections of the way the world actually functions. And when we talk about a vaccine, <clears throat> we talk about interrupting that process. When we talk about sanitation, we're talking about interrupting that process. And we have separated ourselves from those cycles. Not all of us the lucky ones, the ones like you and I that can sit here and say, uh, I don't have to worry about this glass of water that I'm drinking because I know it's safe. We pay a heavy price for that, and everybody knows that. <clears throat> and I don't have to worry about the food I eat, at least not for the most part, because I know that it's inspected, and there are regulations that tell me that there shouldn't be things in there that other people take for granted because they don't have a system that prevents this. So one of these uh, stories that I... I wrote, <laughs> will be based on last um, TWIP's episode of the um, juvenile tapeworm infections. And uh, what I'd like to describe here is sort of an integration of all of the tapeworm stories that we've told so far with a real-life situation, but not based on a real story. This is a made-up story. I want to tell you that to begin with. It's fiction, at least part of it. And, uh, well, you'll see as I as I unfold this. I, I feel... Um, very privileged to be able to do this for an, an audience that's willing to sit there and listen to somebody read them a story. <laughs> so I feel like Meryl LaGuardia did during the uh, newspaper strike in the 1930s when he read the new comic strips to the kids on the radio. <laughs> I presume it's scientifically accurate. Uh, you presume correct, at least as far as it can be. I mean, some of this is speculation, but you'll, you'll see as we All start right. to go through what's it. The, what's the name of your story? Well, the name of the story and the name of this uh, potential book that I would like to eventually write is called Frog Legs and Parasite Tales, T-A-L-E-S. So, so that would be the name of the book as well as that story. That's correct. And this would be a collection of stories about... Yeah, medical anthropological stories dealing with how parasites find their way into our lives and out. Do you think I could do it with viruses? Absolutely. Hmm. Absolutely. No, this is, Vince, there are some wonderful viral stories. Wonder, in fact, the one that I like best right now is the one that suggests very strongly that the H1N1 virus is a look-alike for the 1918 virus in terms of the uh, hemagglutinin site. It's an almost identical mutant. Which, we, by the way, we discussed last Friday on TWIB. Uh -huh. You were in Taliesin. Oh, Taliesin. That's correct. <laughs> or Taliesin. <laughs> no. Yeah, that, we, that was an interesting story. And it, it's why the... Older people who have yeah. lived from 1918 to about 1935-40 and who presumably were infected with influenza are immune to the exactly. current strain. Yeah, it's all similar. the generals and... Uh, <laughs> Dixon, do you know why the 1918 and the 2009 virus hemagglutinins are so similar? Do I know why? Is there a yes. why reason for there this? Is, there is a why. You'll tell me. Well, in 1918, that virus went into pigs and stayed ah. there, and it's still there. Uh -huh. And in pigs... Influenza evolves very slowly. Got it. And then it came back into us in another form, very similarly, you know, last year. And so, for antigenically, uh -huh. it was almost identical. 
that hadn't evolved very far. Now, and some people think it's because pigs are slaughtered every six months that they don't have time to select antigenic variants. That makes sense. Right. Sure. So they, um, Adolfo Garcia Sastre, who I spoke with a few episodes ago, mm-hmm. said that uh, there's not enough time to make selective immunity. You only get inf- a pig only would get infected twice in its lifetime. Right. But wild pigs live a lot longer. I know that for sure. Feral. I think we should catch some feral pigs and look at the flus in them. Absolutely. Yeah. You co- you hold them down while I swab them. <laughs> yeah, sure. Well, you're bigger than I am. Yeah, well, they're bigger than All right, let's read us. your story. <laughs> okay, here I'm we go. I'm going to take a nap, and I'll see you later. <laughs> okay, Vince. So remember, the name of this story is Frog's Legs, Frog Legs and Parasite Tales. So I have these uh, chapter headings, but they're not really listed as chapters, so I'll just read them and then read on with the story. The Treatment is often worse than the disease. Physicians lament. Lian Fu made his way along the bank of the rice paddy in a series of deliberate, heron-like steps, careful not to disturb any of the other predators in the area that might be seeking an evening meal. As he carefully edged along the bank, he kept one eye on the water to his right, and the other focused on the grassy bank directly in front of him. He was hunting for frogs but he was also well aware of the dangers of doing so, lessons learned at an early age due to near misses with the likes of Russell's viper. That deadly snake and its relatives were also stealthily seeking out frogs, and rice rats, and mice, too, and would strike at anything that moved. There were other dangers, too. Smaller dangers, malaria and schistosomiasis. Not even the possibility of acquiring these parasitic diseases, both of which were endemic to his home island of Hainan, could deter him from his mission. Three nights had passed without a successful hunt, and his son, Gao, was still sick in bed back at home in Quianjia. A few yards further, Lian Fu startled a small wild cat that had nearly finished eating its second frog of the evening, the remains abandoned in haste as, as the surprised animal disappeared into the protective embrace of twilight. How could he ever find what he had come for, considering the competition he was up against? An uneventful half-hour passed. It was nearly time to go home once again, empty-handed, as the day passed into deepening shades of blue blackness. Then, in the waning half-light, he saw one. It was directly in front of him, suspended in the mirror-like surface of the water, surrounded by rice stems, its eyes peering out like two shining green marbles with jet-black centers. It was a frog, but it was not just any frog. It was the frog. Lian Fu was assured by a traditional healer that this one would relieve the pain in his son's left eye. He approached it with extreme caution, and when he was within range, Lian Fu stopped dead and slowly arranged the small scoop net that he had held behind his back. Then, lunging forward in a single motion, he drew it over the surprised animal and pulled the drawstrings shut. The amphibian struggled, flexing its powerful hind legs against the mesh of the trap, then fell into a motionless torpor, while its captor raced home at full speed. Lian Fu made sure the frog had red stripes along its sides, periodically examining the plump animal again and again, convincing himself one last time as to its correct identity. His son's eye had burned for some time, so much so that the boy could no longer see out of it, Gao's mother failed in her tireless efforts to alleviate the pain and suffering her son was going through. She had used all available resources, warm compresses applied with large doses of tenderness and compassion. In her frustration, Su urged her husband to seek advice from the healer. After he briefly explained the problem to their shaman, the recommendation came as no surprise. A poultice made of freshly prepared frog tissue. The old man emphasized that using the right kind of frog was essential, and in a carefully detailed explanation described to Lian Fu the ways to identify it, down to its characteristic eyes and side markings. At home now, he killed the hapless amphibian, uttered a prayer of thanks over the carcass, and then carefully dissected out the thigh muscle and all of the skin next to it. The tissue was spread open and flattened to fit the contour of Gao's face. Lian Fu draped the inner surface of the frog leg segment against the diseased area. 
At first, the boy winced against its unfamiliar texture and temperature, but soon he appreciated the soothing coolness it afforded. A cloth bandana secured the leg and skin flap in place while his son slept, and was removed briefly for daily inspections of the tender area over the next few days. Within just two days, the eye showed definite signs of improvement, and by the end of the fourth day, Gao was able to see again for the first time in a month. That week, his son returned to a full state of normal health, but Gao was soon aware that something had gone terribly wrong. A perceptible tightness developed around the orbit of his cured eye. The prodromal swelling progressed, becoming noticeable to others within the next few days. The discomfort from it was evident in the boy's irritability. He began losing sleep and was in a state of constant agitation. Su and Lian Fu were saddened by this discouraging turn of events, and worse, neither they nor their shaman could help any further. Gao was told by the old healer that he was most unfortunate, but he would have to live with his new disease, as many others had done before him. Their son eventually lost the sight in his left eye. He had contracted sparganosis, a disease caused by a widely distributed tapeworm, Spirometra mansonoides. This cestode parasite, in its juvenile form, usually lives in the tissues of its cold-blooded hosts, for example frogs, fish, and snakes. When the larva encounters a human host through topical application of tissue containing the immature worm, it can result in the disease known as sparganosis. The biology of this group of tapeworms is complex, with several species of animals serving as intermediates in order for the parasite to complete its journey from egg to adult. The description of the life cycle of S. mansonoides that follows may appear somewhat fanciful, almost made up, to those not familiar with the field of parasitology. Even card-carrying parasitic disease researchers that claim this field for their own express amazement at the sheer complexity of living parasitologically given all the apparent obstacles encountered along their rites of passage. The twists and turns that most of these specialized organisms go through to carry out their lives would challenge the most imaginative fiction storytellers, including the likes of Stephen King and Isaac Asimov. Yet the wide distribution of this group of invertebrates attests to the fact that they have evolved into a very efficient way of life indeed. This tapeworm has managed to succeed on a grand scale, what appear as weak links in its life cycle may actually turn out to be points of reinforcement given the hundreds of species of cold-blooded vertebrates which aid in its growth and maturation. Stranger in a Strange Land A novel by Robert Heinlein, science fiction writer. Spirometromansonoides is not only found in Hainan, but also throughout many other parts of Southeast Asia, including Vietnam, Laos, Cambodia, Thailand, and mainland China, places where poultices are commonly used to treat open wounds and a variety of eye diseases. It is also distributed throughout South and Central America and in some parts of the southern United States. The incidence of the juvenile form of the tapeworm in frogs is high in Hainan, with Rana tigrina rugulosa being the dominant species in that area. This particular frog is also the amphibian of choice for poultices used in Quianjia and other villages on that island. The prevalence of the adult tapeworm in wild and domestic cats is as much as 100% in some areas, while aberrant juvenile infections in humans is more variable, but can be as high as 30% in the mountainous regions of Hainan. Spirometra starts its life as a free-swimming, microscopic larval animal in the stagnant fresh water, then sequentially infects a crustacean, a tadpole, and its adult equivalent, the frog, or alternatively a snake or fish. Its long journey ends when the mature worm develops in the gut tract of the cat. Predation gets it from one host to another. With each new host, it undergoes transformations that bring it closer and closer to adulthood and in that regard is like many kinds of insects that change to various forms throughout their lives, undergoing complete metamorphosis. Butterflies and moths employ this type of developmental cycle. However, the main difference between these beautifully delicate creatures and spirometra is the dependency of the parasite on other life forms in order for it to carry it to the next stage. 
The adult worms live in the lumen of the cat's small intestine, as do all other adult tapeworms. That is to say that they all live in the gut tracts of their definitive hosts. Since Spirometra lacks a proper digestive tract of its own, it obtains all of its nutrients by absorbing a portion of the digested meal from the host across its specialized outer surface called the tegument. Total dependency for its nutrition on the host, in which it resides, defines it as an obligate parasite. The diversity of environments encountered by Spirometra within each of its host animals presents the worm with a bewildering array of physiological challenges. Its trek begins as an embryonated egg produced by the adult worm and is shed into the environment by the infected cat through the act of defecation. Each egg contains a ciliated larva called the coracidium, and upon entering fresh water it hatches from its protective shell and swims about freely. Strictly speaking, Spirometra is not a parasite at this point and can only remain in that state for an hour or so as its energy source, glycogen, is limited. Our listeners will recall that we have covered the pseudophilidian tapeworms in the form of the fish tapeworm, Diphilobothrium latum. This parasite is related to that one. As Spirometra expends its precious energy of glucose, its sinuous beating cilia serve to attract the attention of numerous zooplanktonic life forms, including its first victim, a small crustacean related to Daphnia. The crustacean eats the coracidium, mistaking it for an item of food. Again, true to its nature, the parasite ends up with the advantage, insinuating into the host's muscle tissue and consuming a portion of it while developing to the next form, the procercoid larva. This stage, along with its first host, must also be eaten, this time by either a tadpole, snake, or fish, in order for the trip to continue. Spirometra settles into the muscle tissue near the skin of its new cold-blooded vertebrate host. During this time, the parasite develops further, ingesting a small portion of that host in the process, and now assumes the shape of an amorphous, thread-like, almost featureless organism, the pleurocercoid juvenile. This is the stage responsible for sparganosis in humans. In addition to using poultices, we can also acquire the juvenile stage of this tapeworm by swallowing infected crustaceans along with contaminated drinking water. When this occurs, the worm can still grow to the pleurocercoid stage, but now they locate to anatomic sites throughout the body other than the eye. Finally, cats and other felidae, such as tigers, leopards, and panthers, acquire the adult tapeworm by eating infected frogs, snakes, or fish that harbor the infectious pleurocercoid juvenile. Spirometromancinoides has been selected for life in a number of different microenvironments. First, the worm encounters a hypotonic milieu, i.e. low salt concentration compared to its own, in fresh water. Then, a hypertonic one, i.e. higher than normal salt concentration, in the blood space and muscle tissue of the crustacean. Yet another hypertonic environment is engaged when it enters the tadpole and frog. All the while, the parasite is being subjected to a fluctuating temperature gradient until it infects the cat, where it enters its final environment. The essential niche of the cat is characterized by an elevated constant temperature and a fluctuating food supply. The adult parasite doesn't eat until the cat eats. It's no wonder, then, that scientists who study the details of Spirometra's life are still largely unaware of most of the detailed biological needs of this fascinating organism. One of the more interesting features of the Pleurocircoid juvenile is its ability to make and secrete a substance that induces uncontrolled cellular growth in its host tissues. The pleurocircoid factor, PGF, called the growth factor, has been purified and characterized. It is a 27.5 kilodalton protein with cysteine protease activity that can also interact with growth hormone receptors in most mammalian species. When the pleurocircoid, or PGF alone, is injected under the skin of laboratory-reared mice, the rodents grow to immense proportions, often achieving three times their normal size within a month. Under natural conditions within the frog, this increased growth can spell disaster, since obese frogs are sluggish compared to their normal counterparts, and are thus easier prey for those animals that hunt them for food. Humans cannot be infected with the adult worm due to significant differences between our intestinal physiology and that of cats. In circumstances where frog, snake, or fish muscle, or frog skin containing pleurocircoid juveniles is used as poultice, the parasite's highly evolved nervous system can detect the heat of the mammal. This temperature gradient acts as an environmental cue, triggering a thermotactic behavior. It crawls out of the cold-blooded vertebrate tissue and goes into the open wound or under the eyelid of the unsuspecting poultice user, as was the case in Gauss treatment. 
The PGF elicits a cellulitis, and if left unattended, can lead to blindness. Not infrequently, the juvenile parasites seeks other ecological niches, such as the optic nerve behind the eye or even the brain itself. In those latter rare cases, more serious consequences can result in causing the infected person to experience loss of sensory or motor function. Rarely, death may be the outcome of infection. Spirometra is indeed a stranger in a strange land when it enters the human host. Luck favors only those who are prepared. Louis Pasteur, writer of Scientific Fact. Michael Zasloff entered his small instrument-packed laboratory at the National Institutes of Health that morning, as he had done nearly every other morning for the past six years. The sign on the outer door read, Transfection Laboratory, Kermit the Frog Division. He rarely took off holidays, and that in itself was becoming a bit of a sore point at home. He was an intense laboratory scientist, driven by the excitement that permeated throughout one of the world's great, if not the greatest, biomedical research complex in the world. The light was on, and the faint smell of a freshly made batch of film developer intermingled with the ever-present background odor of lab stench told him that his technician had gotten in early again and probably finished the northern analysis. He took off his jacket and hung it up in a corner of the lab-designated office and yelled good morning to anyone who might be around to hear him. Zasloff began to open the daily flood of mail as he sat on the edge of his desk, its small metallic surface cluttered with half-reviewed manuscripts, half-written papers, half-read journals, and a thousand other memos, notes, scribbles, and order forms for exotic reagents and plastic disposable items. All of this stuff was essential to running a productive, cutting-edge research program in gene therapy. His research assistant had been there since 6.30 that morning, counting frog eggs that had been injected the night before with DNA fragments and developing the key northern blot. She greeted him with her usual customary deadpan expression, suppressing her excitement over the new result, and announced the daily casualty report from the recovery room. Four frogs had survived the critical evening, while she had removed one that morning that she had found floating belly up in its small aquarium. All of the egg-laden female African clawed frogs, Xenopus lavis, had had an ovary removed the day before. The ovaries yielded their complement of eggs, and each egg was the recipient of DNA fragments, copies of human gene segments engineered by the designer gene jocks, as Zasloff referred to them. The transfection experiment would tell him whether or not his gene constructs were incorporated into the frog's own DNA in the proper orientation, thus allowing the proteins they encoded to be produced. She then handed him the exposed, developed X-ray film, showing numerous blackened lines corresponding to the hoped-for positions. Zasloff's face slowly broke into a broad smile as he examined the thick, flexible plastic sheet. They shook hands and laughed out loud. It had finally worked. All the time he had spent hunched over the computer keyboard searching electronic data banks for clues as to how to proceed, and she at the bench not to mention the endless monotony of all those sleepless nights going over failure after failure. All that was history now. Their persistence had been rewarded that early morning and without fanfare or the blaring of trumpets. In the quiet of a small, equipment-filled room, two human beings shared a small part of nature's secret world a world that in that moment had become a little less unknown. At lunch in Building C's sprawling cafeteria, Zasloff and a lunchmate, regular, once again reviewed the day's global issues and in just under an hour to boot. They began over salad, noting recent government reductions in research funding, an outbreak of a fortunately benign strain of Ebola virus in a nearby Virginia laboratory, and observing that if that particular virus strain had been more virulent, the entire eastern seaboard might have been placed on red alert. Between mouthfuls of the daily special, a tuna surprise-like concoction chucked full of good nutrition, Zasloff described his latest results. His colleague's eyes widened, and he nodded his approval as he continued to eat. They turned the conversation to the last article in the Journal of the NIH Research, documenting the sharp increased prevalence of drug-resistant tuberculosis and malaria over the last few years. It emphasized the lack of new drugs to combat them. They commiserated over numerous backyard horticultural failures. The rice pudding, reasonably edible as judged by the rhythmic steady rate of consumption, was eaten to the low-pitched din of science babble. Then, without any appreciable 
provocation, Zaslav's gaze changed from a postprandial stare into space to one of almost inward enlightenment, marking the end of the lunch break. They briskly walked back towards their respective labs, and Michael wished his friend luck with his own transfection problems as they parted company in the hall. He looked briefly again at the northern blot on the x-ray box, then went over to his desk, sat down, and began poring over his records. This time he ignored the data pertaining to genetics and concentrated on determining how many frogs had survived the operative procedure he employed to obtain their eggs. The surgery involved making a small midline incision down the abdomen and removing an ovary with a forceps under less than sterile conditions. After expressing the eggs out onto a petri dish, the ovary was returned to its approximate anatomical position and three stitches repaired the abdominal wall. The animals were then returned to their individual infirmaries. Gross contamination of the wound site was unavoidable. Paging back through the data books, he carefully transcribed the numbers onto a piece of yellow lined paper in single neat columns. The headings read 1. Number of frogs operated. 2. Number of frogs alive. Day 2 post op. He punched the numbers on the calculator as they were recorded, including last night's result. A total of 45 frogs were used in 1993 with 9 deaths. Researchers throughout the country who used the same operation routinely bemoaned the high mortality rate, but no one knew of another way of getting out viable eggs. Besides, the frogs were inexpensive compared to exotic inbred strains of rodents that might have been used to explore the human genome. In contrast, Sasloff was now more impressed with the survivors than by the unfortunate donors who succumbed to post-operative infections. Only a 20% mortality rate in Xenopus, in the face of a procedure that, if performed on humans without the advantages of antibiotics, all would surely have died from peritonitis within a week. That night at home, he announced that he was going to temporarily stop genetic research and begin to investigate the reason or reasons why his egg donors were so tenacious. He ventured that the answer might already be known, but if it wasn't, he might be at it for some time to come. His wife expressed the hope that this new avenue of work would be more low-key and thus lead them to spend more quality time together, even take a vacation, perhaps. Six months of intensive work later, Zasloff informed his section chief at the NIH that he was giving up his position to form a biotech company and would locate it in Philadelphia. His new research on frog skin had generated tremendous interest, especially among venture capitalists. He had no trouble convincing several of them to fund the new company after they carefully reviewed Zaslav's findings. His research could now focus solely on the testing and manufacture of his newly discovered polypeptide substances found in frog skin that had proven to have outstanding antimicrobial characteristics. He named the new class of compounds meganin, a word derived from the ancient Hebrew word megan, meaning shield and showed that female Xenopus lavis produces at least two varieties within the secretion glands of its epidermis. We now know that versions of meganin 1 and 2 are produced by virtually all frog species so far examined, and each species produces slightly different forms of them. Since there are approximately 3,800 species of these amphibians in the world, it is possible that there are thousands of different antimicrobial peptides related to these two parent compounds waiting to be discovered. Meganins are polymerized linear compounds made from a unique mixture of amino acids and are chemically similar to the antibiotic gramicidin, first described by René Dubose. The chemical structure and proposed mechanisms of activity for meganins have been determined. In a solution of water, each molecule assumes a corkscrew-like shape that aggregate into a barrel-shaped aggregate whose properties include the ability to create a structural defect in the outer membrane of most living cells, thus destroying them on contact. The canins are effective in vitro against a broad range of infectious agents ranging from bacteria to fungi to protozoans. In mammals, however, they are quite toxic. But even this may turn out to be an advantage since initial trials in which they were injected directly into certain kinds of solid tumors were very encouraging. To date, they have been only partially successful when applied to experimental infectious diseases. When more is known as to how to chemically modify them and to optimize their route of injection, the gainins may even be effective agents against tuberculosis and malaria. 
both of which now exhibit extensive drug resistance to conventional antimicrobial chemicals. Very recently, a meganin-like acrylamide compound with similar properties has been synthesized and may prove useful for creating garments and hospital linen with antimicrobial activity. It's the depletion of the stratospheric ozone layer, stupid. Message from the amphibians to the air polluters. The central Oregon sun burned through the mist that filled the valley, dull, haze, rouge-colored. Its heat soon enough eroded it away, layer by wispy layer, first on the crests of the mountains, then onto Lost Lake itself, until the fullness of its light penetrated the crystalline water, illuminating the sandy, weedy-covered bottom around the shore. Thick plexiglass enclosures, each measuring two cubic feet and open only on the bottom, dotted the edge of the water, as teams of technicians and graduate students bent over them, examining the life underneath them. Protected from the harsh UVB radiation now penetrating down on land and water alike. This was the second year of a three year project on that central Cascades Lake to determine the effects of ultraviolet radiation on the development of amphibians, and in particular frogs and toads. Dr. Andrew Blaustein, the director of that study, often expressed his concerns regarding the detrimental effects of stratospheric ozone depletion on the life of the western toad, Bufo borealis. Some of his early detractors had in jest labeled him Chicken Little, but the joke grew thin over the past several years, as did the ozone layer. Blaustein knew that many species of amphibians around the world were in decline, especially since his graduate students were responsible for annual population surveys of Bufo. Eventually, in the late 70s and 80s, concern was openly expressed among his colleagues as well, as one by one they reported at various national and international meetings about the alarming rate of decline in amphibian populations, especially those that deposited their fertilized eggs in shallow water. In addition, there were the deformities. Three legs, five legs, one leg, three eyes, all depressing findings, and not just restricted to amphibians native to Oregon, in fact, Minnesota appeared to have more than most states. But why? Ozone, its chemical symbol is O3, is an unstable molecule arrangement of normal atmospheric oxygen, designated O2, that has the unusual property of intercepting and neutralizing the harmful effects of UVB radiation that emanates from direct sunlight. Even more unusual is the fact that UVB radiation induces the formation of ozone to begin with by interacting with O2, splitting it apart and allowing the radical O to interact with O2, forming the unstable isotope O3. Stratospheric ozone serves to protect life on Earth by preventing interactions between UVB and DNA. Without this shield, the rate of skin cancer in humans would be astronomical. As it is, those fair-skinned individuals that live at high altitudes and at latitudes near the equator have an increased risk from developing non-melanoma versions of skin cancer. It is a fact that worldwide skin cancers of all kinds are on the rise and may be the result of a thinning stratospheric ozone layer. Furthermore, UVB radiation has been shown under controlled conditions in the field to reduce the growth of important phytoplankton species of the Southern Ocean. A significant depletion in the population of krill is a likely result if this trend continues. Many life forms in that remote region of the world rely on krill, including the humpback, finback, and blue whale, and nearly all species of penguin, so depleting their primary food source, the krill, would mean a decline in their populations as well. Polar orbiting satellites, TOMS, for example, with special detectors, have documented the annual cycle of the loss, an eventual repair, albeit not complete, of the ozone layer each spring at the South Pole. Data from weather stations in northern Finland have shown that a seasonal ozone hole has also formed around the North Pole. If that hole enlarges to include the northern United States and Europe, it could prove disastrous for countless life forms, including frogs, toads, salamanders, and other water-breeding animals. The loss of this important group would surely trigger the loss of other groups as well, although perhaps not as predictably as the situation that exists in the Southern Ocean, since these terrestrial food webs are more complex. Suffice it to say that the layer of ozone at both poles is reduced and continues to worsen with each new spring, and that with respect to life on Earth is a bad thing. 
Blaustein's experiments point to a detrimental effect of UV radiation on the development of toad eggs and may turn out to be the sole reason why these amphibians are not doing well in the shallow waters of Lost Lake. Nearly 85% of the fertilized eggs shielded from direct sunlight developed normally and went on to adulthood, while those left exposed to direct sunlight had a greater than 40% mortality rate after the second week of development. Northwestern species of salamanders did even less well, with over a 90% mortality rate in their egg masses. Those species that bred in deeper water where UVB radiation could not reach the bottom were not affected. Fortunately, there are some exceptions, such as the Pacific tree frog, which appears to be resistant to the effects of UVB radiation. Their populations remain unaffected, probably due to unusually high levels of a special enzyme, photolyase, a protein that repairs the damage done to its DNA by UVB radiation. Studies on adult frogs in other parts of the world have identified a parasitic trematode, flatworm, capable of inducing malformations during early frog development. This finding has complicated the picture as to the causes of amphibian declines and deformities. And as if that were not enough, yet another set of players has also been identified. Fertilizers and herbicides. Again, Dr. Blaustein's research team has led the charge. Frogs reared in ponds with increased nutrients, agricultural runoff laden with fertilizers, had many more trematode parasites than those raised in clean ponds. The reason this happened is likely due to the fact that the trematode parasites require snails for their intermediate hosts, and nutrient loading increases the number of snails in any given area of freshwater. So a new, more comprehensive hypothesis for the role of UVB radiation in frog declines and malformations has emerged based on, based on this new information. It is proposed that UVB radiation has a direct effect on the ability of amphibians to resist infections by compromising their immune systems. This is certainly the case for mammals, in which exposure at the level of skin to increased amounts of UVB radiation results in the death of large numbers of dendritic, i.e. macrophage-like cells. This severely limits the ability of the animal to process antigen efficiently, leading to a greater susceptibility to parasitic infections that enter through the skin, such as the cutaneous form of Leishmania. Perhaps this UVB damage acts at the level of the frog skin, depressing the, the amphibian's ability to produce therapeutic levels of meganins. Other findings may also partially account for the demise of frog populations, namely the overuse of the herbicide atrazine. In 2002, for example, over 63 million pounds of this chemical was spread out over a vast portion of the agricultural landscape. Atrazine remains in the environment for some 140 days, so its effects are long-lasting. Numerous studies have shown that this chemical is capable of converting male tadpoles into female frogs, even at low concentrations. Atrazine is just one member of a larger class of compounds, referred to as endocrine disruptors. Many of these substances, including PCBs, DDT, and dioxins, contaminate much of the world's freshwater aquatic environments and thus have an excellent opportunity to become absorbed by immature amphibians. Why should anyone care if frogs and toads disappear, or for that matter, anything else does? To most of us, a catastrophic reduction in the biological diversity of amphibians could be really bad news. To begin with, solutions to some of the more serious human diseases, such as drug-resistant tuberculosis and malaria, hospital-acquired Staphylococcus aureus, and penicillin-resistant syphilis, all rely on new generations of natural products in the form of antibiotics derived from soil-dwelling organisms. Other antimicrobial agents are derived from plants, such as quinine that comes from the bark of the chinchona tree. It is still the parent drug for newer ones, for example, mefloquine used to treat some forms of drug-resistant malaria. It is most discouraging to realize that between malaria and tuberculosis, nearly 6 million people will die each year throughout the world. That is a death rate of some 400 people per hour. Taxol, a proven anti-cancer drug, was originally derived from the bark of the Pacific U. There are now synthetic derivatives of Taxol, whose recent synthesis in the laboratory of the pharmaceutical industry probably saved the yew trees from becoming extinct. There are numerous other examples, but more to the point, where will future generations of antibiotics come from when all of the easily isolated ones have run their course, and the natural resources we now take for granted, coral reefs, temperate and tropical rainforests, for example, 
are severely damaged. Incidentally, it now takes at least 10 to 12 years to bring a safe prescription drug to market, starting from the moment it is discovered to the time it arrives on the druggist's shelf. Natural products chemists have rarely been able to take advantage of the hints given to them through chance encounters with traditional medicines. On the other hand, the McGainan story is a superb example of luck favoring the prepared mind. Continued research on these interesting biological molecules could lead to their practical application if their toxicity can be tamed. Yet even here, the task of drug development is not easy. For instance, a random walk through the 3,800 or so species of frogs in search of a truly safe use and effective meganin would be a largely fruitless one that was not interest too many drug companies, if any at all. However, even if the decision were made to do so, it may be too late since amphibians are dying off at an alarming rate. How then can we take advantage of the world as it exists and shorten the time between discoveries of new treatments and their application to human disease? A survey of human populations that use poultices made from frog, fish, and snake tissues, and for what purposes they are used, may very well lead to new therapies against illnesses Western medicines can no longer cope with, using standard antibiotic therapies. This ethnobiological approach requires an intimate knowledge of human diseases and human behavior. Most importantly, it requires an open mind. Those cultures that include poultices of various kinds as a regular part of their pharmacopoeias have learned by trial and error which natural products work and which ones do not. However, they are often reluctant to share this information with outsiders. Displays of skepticism and arrogance by Western-trained doctors and healthcare providers denigrating these kinds of healing modalities don't go far in facilitating entrance into their private stocks of drugs and other methods of treatment. It may appear trite to some to say that an open mind knows no boundaries and is willing to believe what it derives through rigorous scientific inquiry as the truth, no matter how radical the data appear. Yet this open attitude must be fostered in a much wider forum to future generations of scientists if we are to survive the next onslaught of infectious diseases, entities predictably lurking around the next dark corner of this crowded planet. So in conclusion, the process of natural selection driven by punctuations of environmental upheaval produces a series of correct answers to questions regarding the way animals and plants survive in their complex niches inventing new defense mechanisms as they are needed, and dispensing with ineffective ones. These mechanisms include the synthesis of antibiotics and other related substances. Our survival as a species will rely more and more on our ability to seize upon and exploit any biological answer when it is encountered in its original setting. We must learn to do so in a very short period of time, since the microbial world seems to be in a much greater hurry than us. Thank you, Dixon. You're welcome. It's really a, an, a lesson wrapped in a story, isn't it? That's the attempt. So it's not fiction at all. Well, uh, Lian Fu's story is fictional. Sure. I wrote that to include the life cycle of the cycle of uh, pseudofluidian tapeworms. And sure. uh, since we covered that last time, I guess yeah. maybe I've uh, given a review. <laughs> yeah, no, we should be familiar, although perhaps that particular tapeworm we didn't discuss, right? We did not. No, this is a new one. It's a new one, but it's the life cycle is similar. It's identical except for the fact that the definitive uh, uh host is a cat rather than a human. And he acquired it by eating a frog or a fish or a snake. The cat acquired it, but when the the man made a poultice from the frog, it crawled out of the skin and went into the eyelid of the person. Yeah. Now I can show you pictures Vince from uh a survey done by uh, some physicians on the island of Hainan of whole families of children. All of their eyes are swollen because of the use of this poultice. They were trying to alleviate the uh, photosensitivity by, uh, from chickenpox. And, of course, it did give them some comfort. But at the same time, these worms then detected the warmth and, and created this other problem where the worm actually secretes a growth hormone. Mm -hmm. It occurred to me that if we were interested in making... Uh, mouse genetics more accessible by being able to obtain more serum, let's say, from a given strain of mouse where their, their MHC complexes are well known and they're producing specific products, right. uh, we could just inject them with um, <laughs> the pluricircoid growth hormone factor and create a mouse that's sure. now 10 times larger than normal mice. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. Save on animal costs. Many years ago, 
I went to a Gordon conference, a scientific conference, yep. as you know. Yep, I do. And the man speaking before me, me had discovered McGainan's. Oh, that's Michael Zasloff. And I was totally that's, fascinated he's by the real, this. This is the real sure. story. I actually called him to verify all this, by the way. And then he heard my talk, in which I talked about poliovirus and the fact that there are tiny pores in the capsid into which uh -huh. there is Something. a naturally occurring lipid, which you can substitute with an antiviral drug. So I, afterwards, I went up to him and I said, well, he came up and he said, that's very interesting. And I said, do you think there are similar <laughs> things, compounds to Meganians that might fit into this yeah. caps? He said, sure, yeah. we should screen it. And so we had a nice conversation about doing something, but we never did. Oh, well. However, there are small molecules, similarly naturally occurring molecules that have since been shown to inhibit other viruses. Nice. We'll have to talk about that on a TWIV. Love to. Yeah. Yep. Would you like to hear a few queries of email? I would. Christina writes, Dear Vincent and Dick, just a quick message to say thank you for this informative and fun podcast series. I have enjoyed all three episodes and hope to listen to many more. Just the right thing for a former Leish maniac. Hey. Now a teacher. There Leish you. maniac, which we will discuss one day. Yeah, we will. You're, always, you're never a former Leish maniac. You're always a Leish maniac. <laughs> That's right. Once you become one of those, you're there for life. Sean writes, hi, I just found your podcast and am enjoying it immensely. I just have one nagging question about the first episode where it was said uh -huh. there was no parasite more complex than insects. I was wondering about lamprey, uh. which I find kind of horrifying. And then I also was thinking of vampire bats. Thank you for the podcast and your time. Well, uh, I... You know, I would love to extend the definition of parasite up that far of the phylogenetic tree, but I think when you get up that high, when the, when the organism that's taking advantage of another organism is basically the same size, mm. then you're into predator-prey relationships. Okay, so the lamprey eel actually sucks a tissue fluid out of the uh, tissue of a uh, freshwater fish. That's what it does for a living. So it's big? like It's big. It can be, uh, oh, three feet long. Lamprey eels are, are gigantic. And um, they have these rasper-type, um, it's a jaw arrangement, but they're jawless, they're jawless fish, basically, okay? They're ignathia, and they're, they're cartilaginous, so they're not actually fish. They're, they're in another category. But they, they suck onto the surface of a fish, and then they rasp these tooth-like uh, projections into the flesh, and then they suck out uh, the lifeblood, basically, of the fish itself. Do they kill the fish eventually? They very often. The, the fish doesn't die right away from this. When the lamprey releases itself, the wound itself is long time in healing. Because I think they uh, inject some anticoagulant at the same mm. time, like uh, regular leeches. Uh, but the lamprey then swims off and has obtained enough nutrition to mate, and then swims up into fresh water and lays their eggs, and then they die. That's their life cycle. So... You know, if you wanted to consider it parasitic, but not a parasite, it, it exhibits parasitic behavior. But I would call this a prey, predator prey relationship. There are some fish, by the way, that swim in the Amazon River that feed on the fins of other fish. That's how they eat. That sounds ridiculous, but that's, mm -hmm. that's what they eat. They eat the fins of other fish, the fins then grow back, and these fish are constantly nipping off little pieces of fish for their meal. Now, is that a parasite? No, of course not. And you'd say, well, vampire bats, you know, they have to drink blood in order to survive. That's, what, that there's, that's their sole food. But um, I wouldn't consider a vampire bat as a parasite, but their behavior is parasitic. All right. How's that? I think that's fine. Michael writes, hey, guys, I love the show, but I am disappointed that it is only once a month. Please, <laughs> please do at least twice a month. I'm sure we'll be begging for every week then. We'll try. We'll try. I'm a pre-med student and love to learn from Twiv and Twip. I would Great. also love if you would talk some more about how the body will respond to some of these parasites in regards with various humoral processes. How will the parasites you are talking about show up in the blood chemistry? Right. Well, yeah, I think you talked a little bit about that with the tapeworms. I did, but I, there's more to be said, of course, and that's true for the virus infections as well. I mean, it's not a one-way street here, right? Yeah, uh, we will do it yep. as much as... Uh, sure. We'll possibly. give you the yeah, yang and the ying side of these relationships. Destani writes, Hi, I recently started listening to TWIV a few weeks ago, through which I found TWIP. <laughs> <laughs> I must say that I didn't think that parasites could be so interesting. Uh-huh. 
I love what you guys are doing, and the only thing I would change is the frequency. I'd love to hear more. Well, we'll do our best here. Like we said, we'll do our best. Yeah, we will do our best. I think we're going to be at least every other week. I'd love, uh, however much we can fit it into our schedules, we'll do it. Jesse writes, I was wondering if you could go over information about tapeworms. <laughs> I think this is an older email. I believe it might be. <laughs> could you also discuss the myths versus facts of tapeworms? For yep. example, can tapeworms help you lose weight? Right, we, we did just that. that. I enjoy listening to your show and hope it continues for a very long time. Yep, we do Thank too. Thank you. Yeah, we do too. Uh, we will do it as long as we are able. Yeah. Well, if I can get up and see and hear and type and talk, I will do it. Yep. Uh, same here. And the same with Twiv. Same here. I promise I won't read any more stories also. <laughs> I think they would like the story. Well, Something maybe. different. And we have another one in the books, so I, I yeah, could I think do it's this good. again. We'll it's, see. A, it's an audience. Listen, you know guys, what? if you don't like what Dixon did, tell us. <laughs> or if, if you, you like, like it. it and you'd like it once every few months, tell us. Because yeah, yeah, Dixon yeah, yeah. would like to run his stories by you. This is true. Mike writes, I'm a garbage truck mechanic who is hoping to teach high school biology upon retirement. I received a master's degree in chemical and life sciences from UOM College Park, University of Maryland, last year and wrote my thesis on the nitrogen cycle in wastewater treatment. Wow. Twip and Twiv are my favorite podcasts. Okay. Your knowledge, experience, and Socratic style, teaching style, make listening and learning a joy. I'm definitely in the camp that would like to hear a new episode twice per month. The world, borrowing a line from Dr. Mark Chrislip, needs more Twip. <laughs> it would also be wonderful if you could entice a bacteriologist to oh, join your crew and, and add Twib. To the lineup. And what's wrong with mycology also? We could cover the spectrum of everything here if we really put our minds to it, I think. I'm CCing this email to my 18-year-old granddaughter who plans to study microbiology at UC Davis. Oh, that's a great place. She's interested in leprosy and thinks rifampicin can be an effective drug for treatment if oh. modified to reduce its hepatotoxicity. Uh -huh. I've told her that MRSA, AIDS, or malaria research would be better bets for grant writing. <laughs> A wise man already. I tell you, that's, he'll make a good teacher when he gets finished repairing the drugs. <laughs> I would just, i just like to say, it, it is possible that there will be a twib. I have a colleague who would like to do a twib. Great. And it's just a matter of him being the motivating Organizer. force. Yep, 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 yep. Before I get to my question, I'd like to mention the two most startling bits of information Dr. De Palmier related in Twib 5, paraphrasing. One. Some scientists believe that human aging genes are an aberration. Two, type 1 diabetes may be caused by an overzealous immune system response to a virus with an antigenic appearance similar to that of pancreatic islet cells. I know that these were intended as tangential remarks, but they piqued my curiosity. Perhaps you can revisit the concepts in the future. Yes. Yeah, the... the uh, Association of a virus with diabetes is very interesting. We haven't talked about that on Twiv. No. We should. We should. This week in aging. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Well, I thought what I had said about aging, though, was about the parasites, Parasite. not about human genes. So genomes. he said that some scientists believe that aging genes are an aberration. Ah. Well, yeah. if things, let me just put it this way. If things didn't age and die, then there would be very uh, little left for ecological cycles. And yes. you have to have nutrient recycling. So you can't get that without something dying first. Not in our ecosystem anyway. No, not on Earth's yeah, ecosystem. There may be others that aren't based on recycling. So, Vince, I just discovered this, and I almost brought this in for the pick of the week for another show, but I couldn't do this unless we had a twib. So it's a twib question, but it's a, it's a, a generic answer. What is the oldest living thing ever found on Earth? Still living. Still living. Hmm. I'll give you some choices. Uh, bristlecone pine. It's mm -hmm. found in the White Mounts of uh, Arizona. It's large. It's the oldest tree known to man and to women. <laughs> mm -hmm. It's about four thousand five hundred years old. Wow. Sequoias are about three to five thousand years old. They're, they're not quite sure because it's hard to get a ring analysis on them. Mm -hmm. We now have a new record holder. Wow! Even more than that, I have no idea. It's a bacteria that was dug up out of the Greenland ice sheet. Mm -hmm. It dates back 120,000 years ago. Now, how do we know this? Because they just cultured it. I know, but how do we know it's 120,000 years old? Carbon dating. 
It's very simple. Is it very simple? Very simple. And it was still alive. Yes. They're a quarter of the size of E. coli, but they cultured them really? and got them to grow again. The oldest living thing on Earth, 120,000 years old. Which led me to think about that, the premise for the uh, Michael Crichton book, uh, Jurassic Park. Mm. You know, when you've preserved something in amber and the genetics is still there, and if you're a virus and you take this insect out and all the, all the cells of the insect are dead, but the virus particle can be revived by putting it into cell culture, what does that say about life? Can you do that? I, I don't know anyone that's even tried that. What's that again, Sam? Tell me. Here's an insect yes. inside amber, and it's clearly back in the Cretaceous era or some other or Jurassic mm -hmm. era. It's millions and millions of years old. You excise the insect. Yes. You then extract the contents of the body of the insect, and in it you find some viruses. Now, has anyone ever tried to infect a cell culture with those viruses? I don't, know, I don't know of any. Of course, you can make dinosaurs from that DNA. <laughs> well, that's what Michael said, yes. but I... You I don't know, know. It's a good question. You if, know, the, if, the, if the viruses are still intact, uh, I don't see why not. I mean, I would sequence them because then you'd have the whole genome. Of course. If you try and infect cells, you're going to lose your sample. Yeah, yeah. But it may not work. You remember in Jurassic Park, the book, Yes. he didn't have access to too many complete genomic yeah, he sequences. He put in frog sequences. He put in a frog sequence, right. So I want to ask this question then of our listeners. Does anyone know of an instance where we, frag we purposefully extracted and fragmented a known genome? Let's make it frog in this case. We know the complete sequence. We fragment it all up. You isolate it into a tube. Then from those fragments, we reconstruct the entire genome of the frog and inject it into a neutral egg and get a new frog. Have we ever done that? I don't believe so. I don't either. So if we haven't done it with known living organisms and proven the technology, then we have no hope of ever resurrecting any of these animals by the mechanism that Michael Well, you know outlined. that Craig Venter is trying to assemble bacterial genomes and yeast that way. And Correct. He's done that, but he hasn't produced the bacterium yet. Exactly. But they're small compared to others. They are. They're the frog is much 3, 000, bigger, right? Much, much bigger. So, so here you go, October 99, 250 million year old bacteria were found in ancient sea salt beneath Carlsbad, New Mexico. 250 million? Yes. And are they culturable? Yeah, they cultured them. Really? Because they were spores. They are, haven't been identified. Wow. It's referred to as strain 293. May 95, 40 million year old bacteria were found in the stomach of a bee encased in amber. These bacteria were also found in a state of animation, so they were spores. Yeah. So there you go. But these are not spores that they got in the ice sheet, though. These were actual bacterial cells. No, they got... Um, oh, the one you're talking about. How yep. old were they? 120,000. They were in some so the kind oldest of... is 250 million, Dixon. 250 million years yes. old. Oh, that's absurd. That's ridiculous. World's oldest bacteria found in permafrost. This is a more reliable source. Yeah. This is in 2007... Research team discovered DNA from living bacteria more than half a million years old. Half Never before has traces of still living organisms that old been found. So how old are they? Half a million years. Hmm. Try searching with the phrase Greenland uh, ice core. Greenland ice core? Yeah. All right. What would you like to know about it? Well, it, it just arrived on my desk. I get science news, and uh, I was... Not aware of these other studies, obviously. And I was surprised to see how old the bacteria were that could be resuscitated. Not from a spore. These were just the bacterial cells themselves. And it doesn't have anything recent. Okay. All right, let's return to email. Yep. Here we go. So we wrote, um, we read, excuse me. <laughs> All right, so we just finished Mike. Oh, no, we're now done with Mike. Right. Sorry, TWIP5 question. In the Trichinella nurse cells illustration on your webpage, yes. should one of the venules have been identified as an arteriole? Yes. The Wikipedia entry, apologies, I didn't look for a primary source, oh. for venule shows blood flow as artery to arteriole to capillaries to venule to vein. Wikipedia's entry for sinusoid has no illustration, but equates right. capillaries with sinusoids, noting the latter's discontinuous endothelial cells. Right. 
to allow protein entry and exit from the bloodstream. If right. your illustration is correct, does it mean that larvae prefer venous blood exclusively because yes. trichinella is an obligate anaerobe? Correct. And if that is the case, how is pressure differential maintained to move blood through the sinusoids? That's a very good question. You, you knew that question. Yeah, and I think it, it moves because the muscle contracts around it, and it's like a pump. Just like the blood is pumped up from your legs in veins that have little valves. I don't know if anybody knows this, but your yes. veins, mm -hmm. they have valves that only open one way. Right. And so as your leg muscle contracts around yeah. the vein and it pushes the blood up, it never gets back down it Helps again. the circulation. That's right. correct. So your heart couldn't possibly pump like that. So in muscle tissue, that's where this worm lives. Yeah. Every time your muscle contracts, it probably does a similar thing around the nerve cell. So the, it is correct that they're ve venules only. They're venules, and then they're, these are the sinusoids. That's All right. right. All right. Thank you, and more power to TWIP. Hey. <laughs> Jeff writes, you have a great set of shows going. I've been listening to both TWIV and TWIP A. And he says, I think TWIP is reserved for this week in photography, isn't it? <laughs> well, that's not reserved. We just are using it. Correct. There are other TWIPs, too. So we're going right. to be TWIP, kind that don't do or don't. <laughs> TWIP is about parasitism. <laughs> I'm right. a lab tech at CDC working on anaerobic bacteria, specifically C. difficile, oh, clostridium. Great. And while I'm somewhat familiar with the workings of viruses, cell biology degree, I think the workings of parasites are fascinating. <laughs> I'm only a bit familiar with them and their life cycles are amazingly complicated. Yeah. Also, I enjoy the random tangents with interesting anecdote and anecdotes <laughs> antidotes <laughs> <laughs> from science history that's dick's doing yeah uh, well. you, you have the nice sides keep them coming and i'd love to hear more twipa the schedule the current <laughs> schedule is not enough you'll have to find somebody who specializes in bacteria so you can cover the three major sources see of that. infection see that there's a lot to talk about in the bacterial world twipa Last, I think you said The Jungle was written by Sinclair Lewis. Yeah, yeah we've been corrected. Sinclair. Okay, Jim writes, Jim from Virginia. Yeah. Thanks again, gentlemen, for an excellent podcast. You know, I can't keep up with all this. <laughs> you keep adding links to other podcasts and books and topics that need to be studied, yeah. and my garden is starting to grow. <laughs> and now I have a text on biochemistry, one on microbiology, and the two-volume virology set. He needs the parasitic disease book now. <laughs> I finally just gave up on your virology lecture number 10. Watched it, but just too many new terms like elongation that represent a myriad of microcosms of knowledge. Still, it's fascinating to hear and watch, and some of it does soak in. Well, I know the, the virology lectures are pretty intense, yeah. but we will resume basic virology 101. You bet. We haven't forgotten it. That's for my education. <laughs> finish teaching this course, right. and then we'll start so, again. In answer to this email, though, life is a fractal. Yeah, it is. Just the closer you look, the more you see. Listen to this, Dixon. Your asides, like the venules and sinusoids and TWIP, <laughs> oftentimes have more meaning and value to me than the more technical information. It's like little bits of critical information that click into place, the aha wow type moments. That's cool. Great. Dick, the details of your career is so much more enlightening as representing what the majority of science is about than the rare example of a Nobel Prize winner's oh, work. Oh, my goodness gracious. You provide that huge base of knowledge built one jigsaw piece at a time that's needed that leads to breakthroughs. God bless you for your patience and perseverance. Oof. You know, we're lucky to have listeners who write yeah. us like this. I'm also yeah. glad I don't wear hats. <laughs> Thanks, too, for the rundown concerning sushi. I've seen many mentions of flash-freezing fish for sushi to ensure product quality, but no one wants to point out that freezing kills parasites. Right. I'm also pleased to hear that marine parasites are not zoonotic. Is that correct or an oversimplification? None that I know of. It would explain why we don't drop dead after falling in the ocean, considering the quantity of microorganisms there. There is one, though. I mean, if we ever got a twib, I would like to do a presentation on cholera. And I'd like to talk about the true meaning of cholera. Cholera organisms are marine organisms. They live in the estuary, and then they they come to find us through our food. Oh, cool. And they're temporary visitors to our gut tract, but they cause havoc with our lives. We shall. I need to ask now if is if there isn't a growing need to make a list of all the research projects and topics in need of further discussion that you two and your guests have noted in TWIP and TWIV. 
You have notes about each one of these. I'm still working on transcriptions, and eventually one should be able to consolidate all of, all of those so searches can be made, but that may hmm. not help much. Hmm. Yeah, we I do have a list of all the suggested topics. Mm -hmm. should put them... I really need to uh, revisit them because we get good suggestions. Yeah, yeah. I listened twice to this TWIP and TWIV72 lagging behind on those, it seems. What a powerhouse, you guys. Thank you, Jim. Yeah. From Virginia. Absolutely. Jesse writes, hello, doctors. I still enjoy this podcast, quote, so far, end quote. <laughs> I guess we could say the same thing. <laughs> we enjoy it and so far, And discovering that multicellular parasites are even more fascinating than I had thought. I had a comment about something that was mentioned in episode six, though. Mm. When I took a medical parasitology class in college, mm. the professor said that when the pork tapeworm is living in a person, it can sometimes get so long that it loops around up into the stomach where it releases eggs, which then hatch and reinfect that person as juveniles, causing cysticercosis and such serious problems. Is this incorrect? I think it's one of those very, very rare events that might have happened, but uh, more um, common is a regurgitation, all right, a, an event of a, of a reflux, okay? So that the tapeworm that's up near the pyloric valve, if it does include some of the mature and gravid segments, that you could actually vomit them, okay? And then, of course, when you swallow again, then you, you're eliciting the eggs to start to hatch. But the, the commonality of that is very, very, very remote at best because most people with an adult pork tapeworm do not have cysticercosis. So it's, a, it's, it's very rare indeed. I won't eliminate the possibility, though. I know Dr. Pommier mentioned that it might not happen because the immune system would prevent reinfection. No, but he's talking about this. No, no, that's, I, I, didn't, I hope I didn't say that. Um, what I was implying was that, uh, that there's some evidence that, that indeed there is a barrier created by harboring an adult tapeworm to the penetration of the gut tract by the larva. There is some data to, the, to this effect, but that's mostly derived from animal experiments with an animal tapeworm, not a human tapeworm. So, um, it has nothing to do with the eggs being able to penetrate. No, because in most cases, the eggs pass out of the host and get into the field, and that's how they get picked up by the next animal. So, well, here you said you could, I mean, if you release the eggs in the stomach, they they're might. not released, though. When you when well, the worm folds back, I, I see what he's trying to say is that even with that happens, there might be some immunity that right. by harboring the adult worm that would but prevent you, that infection from going any further. Yeah. Uh, you know, it's hard to conduct experiments on humans. <laughs> In fact, it's impossible. Yeah. If it is correct, though, then maybe on that house episode you mentioned, the woman had an adult <laughs> tinea solium growing in her gut from the ham, which laid eggs in her stomach, resulting in neurocysticercosis. Is it possible? Everything is possible. Yeah, I won't but deny they, they won't know that on the house. I'll no, bet. they won't. No, they wouldn't know that. <laughs> so why not use the the more common right transmission method? You know, method? The, the real stories here are fascinating enough without having to make one. Yeah. So, Jesse, that's great. Um, it's possible, but it's so rare, and I don't think they would know it on house. Of course not. And they wouldn't, usually they don't use subtleties like that or rare well, things. <laughs> Another Jesse writes, I know this has nothing to do with viruses or parasites. I thought it was interesting to hear De Dr. De Pommier explain what vertical farming is along with the benefits. Uh -huh. So he has sent a YouTube video, Dixon, <laughs> yes. of Dixon. There he is. Yeah. I've been about 10 of those things. I don't know. <laughs> All right, we'll put That's a link crazy. to this. It's a little CNN. <laughs> Vertical farming began as a class project. It certainly did. In fact, we're thinking about making a This Week in Urban Agriculture as a uh, another web podcast. T-W-I-U-A. Mm, it's a tough one. Huh? <laughs> right. Paul writes, I'm a retired chemist who is not that excited about chemistry anymore but I'm fascinated by viruses and other human diseases. I'm a devoted listener and would like more TWIP. I find audio learning much more effective than reading. Keep up the good work. Interesting. My daughter works in biotech and also listens to your podcast, so we have interesting things to talk about besides grandchildren. <laughs> we feel that diseases will play an increasingly important role in the future of mankind as the planet becomes more crowded and climate change puts more stress on human populations. Here, here. 
understanding these things will help us prepare our progeny for an uncertain future. Thanking, thanks for helping with my education. Here's my question. Could the pork tapeworm be a potential for bioterrorists? Potential scenario. Set up a pig farm in Mexico, <laughs> infect pigs with tapeworm, harvest the eggs from the pig manure, contaminate fresh produce such as lettuce grown in Mexico bound for the U.S. with the eggs, and let nature take its course. It seems to me that this would be hard to detect because there would be no acute infectious outbreak and could go on for months with lettuce being shipped all over the U.S. Would this be a significant public health problem? Yeah, it would. Yeah, I think that would be a scary scenario. Wow. Mm. <laughs> really? That, that could then, work, right? Ten it, years later, of course, this doesn't happen right away. I mean, usually it happens after the parasites begin to die in the tissues, and that's when you get these allergic responses to them. And you get these space-filling lesions actually impinging on some other part of the brain. That's when they're usually detected as they start to die. So they're, they're, they're rather small and defined during their life. And unless it's in really a critical place like the optic chiasma or um, amygdala or some other place in the brain which is hypersensitive to these things, or in your eye where you get vision problems, uh, it would go undetected for many years. But it doesn't have to take 10 years, right? doesn't have to, but their lifespan apparently is something like the, the larval form of this mm -hmm. tapeworm is about 10 years. Because the young lady, what we discussed last time, who had neurocysticercosis, who had just recently been overseas. You're right. Presumably well, that, that hit a sensitive spot, and it, it, if that happens, then it's immediately uh, detectable. But if it's in your eye or somewhere else, not as Well, quick. there's a bunch of our brain tissue. That if you got a neurocysticercosis, you wouldn't know it. Yeah. <laughs> Ever. So that would be a good... Well, I mean, it's so a lettuce, long term. The, the lettuce isn't washed as uh, it comes in. That wouldn't be good enough to do it. You couldn't get everything yeah, out of it. You won't. Not a bad idea. That's a bad idea. He it's says, I often, to tra I, I often <laughs> travel to Mexico and would like to be able to protect myself from tapeworm infections. I got yeah, the idea well. from this podcast. There is no defense if food gets contaminated after cooking. Did I get this right? If there is any spice, is there any spice like chili peppers that might prevent the eggs from hatching? No. Anxiously awaiting your reply. Yeah, not to my knowledge, and I think uh, it's it's this tapeworm is found where you have a lot of food that's spicy. It's eaten already, so in Mexico and Central America, and in South America as well. So the eggs are pretty tough. Pretty tough. And you have to be careful, right? It, it, but in this case, there's no way to be careful because that's right. We, we said that last time. You're at the mercy of the local environment. Should he not go to Mexico? No, remember? One of the big uh, outbreaks was right over here at you know, Ocean Parkway yeah. in Brooklyn. So the parasites will come to you if you don't go to them. Wow. Yeah. yeah. Okay, thanks, uh, Paul. Hope you like that answer. Well, you're probably not going to like it. But... Well, I mean, it's a horrible scenario, but it's possible. Yeah. Lindsay writes, I'm currently a graduate student at the University of Michigan, where I study infectious disease epidemiology and disease ecology. Right. My primary interest lie in the ecological factors that give rise to certain parasitic and environmental infections and yeah. also the evolutionary ecology of pathogen systems. Nice. I've been learning a bit about the evolutionary ecology of parasites and think that this topic would make for, make for a really interesting conversation. I totally agree. This coming summer, I will be working on a project involving malaria transmission in a sub-Saharan Africa urban center. Because malaria and other invertebrate-borne parasitic infections are such big deals in the developing world, I hereby request some casually educational back-and-forth <laughs> rapport on those topics. Done. As soon as we get to malaria, I'll be happy to... Yeah, we to, have to do it before he goes to, to Africa this summer. I'll give you All my right, two we'll cents worth. I was sure glad to hear a new episode. I was worried that the project had been given up. Keep up the good work. No, no. No, we're not giving it up. No, definitely we have not. a malaria guy here, too, we could pull in. We do. Michael writes, thought you might want to share, to share a link to the CDC concerning the basics of common parasitic invaders if you haven't already done so. Yeah, Keep no, up it's, the great work. It's a good link. It's a Let's great link. Let's see what we have here. Yep. It's you know, this all. laboratory identification of parasites of public health concern. You bet. Wow. That's nice. I hadn't seen this, Dixon. Yeah, the American Society for Parasitology has a great website also. Okay, Gary writes, first, I just want to thank you for a great podcast. I find it both educational and entertaining. I was wondering if either of you had read about a treatment developed at the University of Technology, Sydney, Australia, that uses gold nanoparticles that attach to toxoplasmid hunting antibodies. Yes. The gold-carrying antibodies then spread through the circulatory system, affixing themselves to parasites in the blood. 
Once the gold particles are well distributed and widely attached to the parasite, a laser heats up the gold, incinerating the parasites. <laughs> According to the researchers, the laser could be tuned to the so-called tissue window, the wavelength of light to which the human body appears transparent. This way, the laser can pass harmlessly through the skin, burning up the parasites along the way. Cool. I came upon the article, Gold Nanoparticles Take Out Brain Parasite, in Cosmos Magazine and found it very interesting, and I would like to hear both of your comments on the technique in a future episode. Sure. Yeah, maybe when we do the Toxa, we'll handle this. But anyway, we'll put the link to the article here. Yep. Cosmos Magazine. You well, know, we should have picks of the week from the readers or the listeners also. You know, we can probably learn as much as they could if we just knew what they were reading. When a parasite infects the, enters the body, it infects a cell and begins to reproduce. Not always. No. It then ruptures the host cell, releasing organisms into the bloodstream. Not always. Correct. Come on, Cosmos. <laughs> <laughs> I don't mean to be tough, but the tapeworms just don't yeah, do that, right? I mean, a lot of parasites. Thanks Even again. Even some I viruses look- don't do that. Yeah, that's right. What do you mean they don't do that? They get they, they don't rupture latent. the cells. They, they become latent, but they do enter a cell. Oh, well, of course, they viruses do. always have to. Enter yeah, you betcha. Thanks again. I look forward to your next pod. Next podcast. Okay. Yeah. Did you enjoy those emails? I did. Well, if you're a new listener of Twip, please subscribe in either iTunes or at the Zoom Marketplace. The more subscribers we have, we stay on the front page, the iTunes the medical podcast area. Leave a comment there. That always helps as well. We just want more people to discover us Yep. because we think that if you don't know about us, you won't realize how much there is to offer here. I think it's pretty interesting. Please tell your friends all about TWIP. And of course, you can find us at microbeworld.org slash TWIP. TWIP is part of sciencepodcasters.org and promednetwork.com, websites where you can find other high-quality science podcasts. Send us your questions, TWIP at twiv.tv. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, everyone. Dixon, (laughs) good to talk with you again. Vince, a pleasure, as usual. We will see you soon. We will see you soon for TWIV. We will. And then again for TWIP. We will. Maybe Twib and Urban Agriculture. Agriculture. Yeah. Well, that should be cool. Yeah. I would learn something there for sure. <laughs> well, urban, urban, is it Urban ag- Agriculture a new field? It is. It began as an old, old field way back in the early days of whenever we had cities. Yeah. It fell out of disfavor, or it fell into disfavor, I should say. Mm-hmm. And then in recent years, it has been more and more uh, a reality. All right. And today, almost every city has some initiatives going on that will produce food for its local inhabitants. Well, you're going to be on Futures in Biotech in a couple of weeks. Yep. Maybe, maybe you could announce the podcast there. Maybe I could. Maybe I will. First. All right, Dixon. Uh-huh. Thanks, everybody, for listening. You've been listening to This Week in Parasitism. We'll be back soon. Another twip is Parasitic. parasitic.